14 times fewer people. In fact, New Zealand's combined landmass has a lower population than a ton of other smaller islands around the world. When you look at a map of New Zealand, it's a sight to behold. Two magnificent long islands stretching out in the vast South Pacific Ocean. They look so close. To There's a sea bridge in China that stretches 34 miles. But in New Zealand, two major islands lie just 14 miles apart, and still, there's no bridge. The reasons go far beyond engineering. What's stopping a nation from connecting itself? Turns out, it's a story about money, nature, and scale. Chapter 1. A bridge that never was. At first glance, it seems like a missed opportunity. The North and South Islands of New Zealand are separated by a relatively short stretch of ocean called the Cook Strait. At its narrowest point, the gap is just 22 kilometers or about 14 miles. That's half the length of China's Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, the world's longest sea bridge, which crosses 34 miles of water. The logic seems simple. If China can do it, why not New Zealand? After all, connecting Wellington in the North Island with Picton in the South Island would transform travel, logistics, and even tourism. With a direct road route, locals could drive across the country without boarding a ferry, freight transport would speed up, emergency response could be faster, and the country could finally join the list of nations linked by iconic megastructures. But that hasn't happened, not even close. And there's a reason. Actually, there are several. Chapter 2. Cook Strait. Back in 1770, British explorer James Cook became the first European to sail through the strait. He confirmed it wasn't just a bay, it was a true waterway dividing two islands. That's why it's called Cook Strait today. Before him, Dutch explorer Abel Tasman thought it was a closed-off bite. Cook's discovery helped map out New Zealand's coasts and changed how people saw the country forever. What makes Cook Strait uniquely difficult is that it's not just a stretch of water, it's a natural fortress. Geologically, the strait is complex and unstable. Its seabed plunges to depths of nearly 10,000 feet in some parts. That's equivalent to stacking seven Empire State buildings underwater. Add to that an uneven, unpredictable seabed riddled with steep cliffs, hidden ridges, and submarine canyons, particularly the Cook Strait Canyon and Narrows Basin. Above water, things aren't any easier. Cook Strait is one of the most volatile marine corridors on Earth. That's not hyperbole. It's been the site of numerous shipwrecks throughout history, from the Bark Maria in 1851 to the TEV Wahine ferry disaster in 1968, which claimed 53 lives after capsizing during a storm. The tides here are also something else entirely. On one side, the Tasman Sea. On the other, the South Pacific Ocean. They don't sink. When it's high tide on one end, it's low tide on the other. That leads to intense Hence tidal flows often reaching speeds of up to 5 knots. Unlike normal tides that simply move in and out, these flows collide, creating swirling, dangerous currents in the centre of the strait. Currents this powerful don't just make ferry crossings difficult, they challenge even the most advanced oceanographic computer models. And the wind? That's a category of its own. Chapter 3. Roaring Forties and Relentless Winds Cook Strait sits directly in the path of the Roaring Forties, a nickname for the latitudinal band between 40 degrees and 50 degrees south of the equator. Unlike the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere at these latitudes is dominated by ocean. There are few land masses to slow the wind down, so it doesn't slow, it accelerates, constantly. Wind speeds here can exceed 150 miles per hour, that's hurricane strength. For the North and South Islands, the geography acts like a funnel. Winds are compressed and channeled through the gap, turning the strait into a wind tunnel. This isn't seasonal, it's constant. Even modern ferries, with all their safety upgrades, often cancel trips due to these conditions. In 2006, a 14-meter wave slammed the Inter-Icelander ferry Dev Aratere, injuring passengers and damaging vehicles. Had it capsized, maritime experts warned that most on board would have had no time to even reach a life jacket. Building a bridge that withstands these forces isn't just expensive, it would demand groundbreaking engineering. Think of elevated towers withstanding wind shear, long spans resisting ocean swell, and road surfaces designed to remain safe under gale force gusts. And that's before even considering the seismic threat. Chapter 4. A Nation on a Fault Line New Zealand lies directly on the boundary of two tectonic plates, the Indo-Australian and Pacific. It's a collision zone, and it's active. Every year, about 14,000 earthquakes strike the country. Around 200 of them are strong enough to be felt. Some hit hard. In 2013, 
two earthquakes measuring 6.5 and 6.6 .6 struck near Cook Strait. They caused widespread damage in Seddon and moderate damage in Wellington. Back in 1855, a massive quake lifted part of the Wellington coastline by more than two meters in a single event. This is not the ideal place to build a mega bridge. A structure stretching 14 miles with support towers anchored into a shifting seafloor would need to survive not just one earthquake but dozens over a century. It would also have to include shock-absorbing materials, active seismic monitoring systems and instant closure emergency protocols. The price tag? Astronomical. Chapter 5. Tunneling beneath the waves. So what about going under? A tunnel might seem like a smarter option. No waves, no wind and less exposure to the elements. In fact, it could cut travel time dramatically from a three to four hour ferry trip to just a 40 minute drive. Plus, tunnels like the Channel Tunnel between England and France or Japan's Seikan Tunnel prove that massive undersea links are possible. But here's the thing, cost. Some estimates suggest a Cook Strait Tunnel could cost between 10 billion and 20 billion dollars. But more recent analysis by experts in 2025 placed the figure at $50 billion enough to absorb two decades worth of New Zealand's national transport infrastructure budget. And that's just the beginning. The narrowest point in the strait connects the North Island with Arapawa Island, a steep mountainous area in the Marlborough Sounds, remote and undeveloped. So the cost wouldn't just be for the tunnel itself. It would also include massive access roads, emergency evacuation routes, high-speed ventilation systems, seismic proofing, and long-term maintenance. Then there's usage. Roughly one million passengers cross the Cook Strait by ferry each year. That's simply not enough traffic to justify one of the most expensive public works projects in history. Compare that to other countries. The UK has 69 million residents. Japan has 123 million. New Zealand, just over 5 million. The economics don't add up and the tolls needed to repay the cost, let's just say they wouldn't be affordable. Chapter 6. What they do instead. Given all the complexity, New Zealand relies on what it knows best, ferries. Currently, five ships operate across Cook Strait, run by companies like Kiwi Rail's Interislander and Strait NZ's Blue Bridge. They carry both passengers and vehicles between Wellington and Picton several times a day. The journey takes about three hours, half of that is through the open strait, the other half winds through the scenic Marlborough Sounds. Yes, ferries are subject to delays. Yes, rough weather can disrupt travel plans, but they remain the safest, most cost-effective way to move people and freight between islands. And there's something else they offer, experience. Travellers aboard the ferry get panoramic views of New Zealand's coastlines, dramatic hillsides and rugged sea cliffs. Seabirds like gulls and gannets hover above, dolphin pods and fur seals swim nearby. In winter, humpback whales even pass through the strait as part of their migration route. There's a certain magic in it, a kind of moving theatre of wildlife, land and sea. Even the entrance to Wellington Harbour home to the country's oldest lighthouse at Pencaro Head tells a story. Built in the 19th century, it was first operated by Mary Jane Bennett, New Zealand's only female lighthouse keeper. This is transportation, yes, but it's also heritage. Chapter 7. The Bigger Picture Proposals for a Cook Strait bridge or tunnel have surfaced for decades. Some were wildly ambitious, others are more grounded, but none have made it past the planning stage. In a way, the debate reflects New Zealand's scale, priorities and identity. This is a nation built around its isolation, its landscapes are remote, its economy is relatively small and its natural features often win out over convenience. Yes, a bridge could create a new symbol for national unity. Yes, a tunnel could shave hours off travel time. But at what cost? In 1990, adventurer Stephen Priest crossed the strait by hovercraft. In 2021, pilot Gary Friedman flew an electric aircraft across it, the first ever to do so. These stories speak to innovation, yes, but also to a mindset. Find solutions that fit the environment, not fight it. And that's the reality. Whether through ferry, plane or the rare swim, Cook Strait remains a boundary. A beautiful, dangerous, fascinating boundary. One that has shaped the country's geography, culture and identity for centuries. Sometimes the best path forward isn't a direct one. What do you think? Should New Zealand invest in a tunnel, brave the elements with a bridge or keep letting the ocean set the pace? The answer might say more about the future of infrastructure than we think.